not to steal too much thunder, but anyway, Eloise will describe uh, Bron uh, Concordia in its early years here in Bronxville, and we're taking this opportunity in 2010 to celebrate 100 years of classroom activities here in the village. Um, Eloise Morgan is known to many of you also as uh, the village historian and is a special assistant to the president of Concordia College and uh, works on a variety of projects for us. So without too much more, it's my pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> Eloise Morgan. Thank you. <laughs> I probably should have let him go on for a while. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. I'm really pleased with the turnout, and um, it's wonderful to have everyone here to celebrate with us 100 years and 17 days <laughs> since the first classes were held here in Bronxville on the Concordia campus. Um, there was a little talk when I started preparing this uh, about my speaking on the first 100 years so I know these chairs are pretty comfortable, but you'll be glad to know we're going to stick with the first couple of years only. <laughs> About 70, 75 students came in January of 1910. This is a little bit later. There's grass and trees, but that's basically what the campus looked like back then. There were six faculty members, and we are sitting here today about where uh, in a few months, the students themselves would build a baseball field with their own pickaxes and wheelbarrows, probably in the grassy area or a little behind. Another shot just showing the campus uh, in those days. This gorgeous 1910 shot of the administration building, Feth Hall, uh, is one of a series of glass slides from a hundred years ago that we have in the archives here at Concordia. This was one of the things that kind of inspired this presentation because it's fairly unusual to have color images from a hundred years ago. We owe these to Reverend William Kepkin, or Kepchen, I guess the family says nowadays, who um, went around a hundred years ago giving illustrated lectures about Concordia and raising money to uh, move the college to this campus. He was a minister in Manhattan of a Lutheran church on 46th Street, and he was really the driving force that moved the college from its Hawthorne campus to Bronxville. He was secretary of the governing board. He was on the uh, board of the Lutheran Education Society, which had been founded to help fund the, uh, the institution. He um, was involved from the beginning in selecting the site, in uh, hiring the architect and the contractors, and he was construction liaison. The files, we have pretty nice old files from that time, are full of letters written by Reverend Kepkin who, to the architect and to various other people about every little detail of the construction project. Um, I think it's, um, this, is, uh, this is him before he began. And this is Reverend Kepkin after the project is <laughs> finished. <laughs> he was, after, after the buildings were complete, he was still working on punch list items for a couple of years. He worked on insurance. And I think it's really fair to say that without him, there's a very good chance that there would not be a Concordia here in Bronxville. Um, which takes me to the first question I had, which is, why Bronxville? Why is Concordia here? How did that happen? And I wish I had some good answers. Um, there are a few clues, but at that point, Concordia, uh, Bronxville was already starting to get a reputation as a, as a kind of prestigious suburban community. Um, the history of the college, which Paul started to talk about, gives us a little guidance. Uh, it was founded in 1881 in Manhattan, and the um, first classes were held in this building on Broome and Elizabeth Street at St. Matthew Church, uh, which is no longer a Lutheran institution, but um, there were, um, the plan was to have six years of, of classes, four years of high school, and then two years of college, modeled on the German gymnasium model. And the 
Concordia started with two years, and then as the boys grew and progressed through the ages, uh, through the classes, they added eventually the full six years. But it was pretty hard going. Um, after a little burst of enthusiasm in 1881, when the Mother Church had established three of these Concordias around the country, enrollment began to drop. And particularly in New York, parents were leery of sending 11, 12-year-old, 13-year-old boys into the metropolis um, to board with strangers and go to school. Now this is the first class, the 1881 class, and it doesn't look like they're in the metropolis, but you can see how young they look. Um, just little kids. But worse than that, there was little or no support from the mother church. And um, I guess I should say we have the same story today. Um, <laughs> this is one of several, several precursors for the future that we're going to come across this evening. So in about 1893, the decision was made by the church and the school to move out of Manhattan into the country. Uh, the church bought some land in Hawthorne, New York, a residential park, park up there, and they built this fabulous-looking building, uh, which was basically the only building on campus for most of the time they were in Hawthorne. Uh, but looks were deceiving. This building um, had suffered because the construction budget was cut during the construction and there were corners cut in its uh, building, and it began to fall apart almost immediately. Maintenance costs were very high, but worse, there was no sewer system. There was little or no water supply. It came from a reservoir, which, when it got hot, dried up, and um, eventually became contaminated. The person who got the, met the calls when that happened, I suppose they were letters, um, was our Reverend Kepkin. And so he was very instrumental in the movement to get out of Hawthorne. Finally, I think the final blow was an epidemic of diphtheria that hit the school in the spring of 1908. One young man died. The school was closed for six weeks. And um, in January, the decision was made to leave Hawthorne altogether. I think this actually is a picture from probably June or so of 1908 when they held their first graduation of a class who had gone through the whole six years of the Concordia program. This is one of the Kepkin glass slides. The um, school returned to Manhattan where the boys went to um, classes at St. Matthew again in another church and students were once again in private homes. The sports programs and the social life kind of dried up and so they were uh, felt themselves um, homeless, practically homeless for, for that period of time. So that's kind of the background for the backdrop for coming to Bronxville, but I still haven't answered the question of why Bronxville. Um, we do know now that the college was familiar with Westchester County. We know they didn't want to be in New York City, but they wanted to be a lot closer. And it may have simply come down to all that real estate agents tell you, location, location, location. The college purchased, or rather the Lutheran Education Society purchased 14 acres uh, facing White Plains Road, this section right in here. This is White Plains Road and Midland is up here. Um, in July of 1908, it was a nice high flat plateau and they were really quite thrilled. They paid a little over $52,000, which um, apparently was about half the price that the land would have been before the panic of 1907 hit real estate values. So we have another uh, little flavor of the past that sounds pretty familiar today. The, um, the land, the area uh, benefited from great transportation. Not only was there the New York Central train station that we still have, but you'll see here, this is a, a little bit later, probably 1911 shot of the campus, and you can see the trolley tracks on White Plains Road. There were two trolleys running through Bronxville, one on White Plains Road and one on Midland Avenue. This is uh, the trolley coming up from Mount Vernon on what is now Gramaton Avenue. This is it in Tuckahoe coming the other way. And this may be the only picture of a trolley in Bronxville that we have. 
And I deduce a little because this is um, a Kapkin glass slide, so those must be Concordia boys. Obviously, it's a trolley off its track. And I'm, <laughs> I'm assuming it's right out in front of our campus on White Plains Road. I have found one little connection between Bronxville and Concordia before the college moved here, but I'm sure it had nothing to do with the move. Concordia has always had a good uh, sports program, and the baseball team in 1908 considered themselves the best school team in Westchester. And they were thrilled when they got a chance to play the Bronxville AA, which quickly I will say I think is the Athletic Association. <laughs> we, we know it wasn't the public school because the public school in Bronxville then only went through the eighth grade. But there were town teams. And we know, too, that this space, the grass uh, in front here, had at least at some point in history been used as a baseball field in Bronxville by um, semi-pro teams and other teams. So it's possible they played there. That's Garden Avenue in the back. And Concordia won, 9 to 5. They, uh, before the game, the professors and part of the team came over here to see our new land. Nothing, we haven't even bought it yet, but they came over to see how it was and reported back that it was wonderful. It had a big flat space for a baseball diamond. Like a lot of early residents of Bronxville, Concordia bought its campus from William Lawrence, and I think everybody in the room knows that William Lawrence was the founder of modern suburban Bronxville. He's the husband of Sarah Lawrence, and Lawrence Hospital is um, something he founded, and of course we all know about Lawrence Park, uh, which had been developed near the train station on an 86-acre uh, farm. But in 1900, William Lawrence bought this land. And you can see that it runs from Midland, and the lots at the top of that look similar in the street uh, layout, similar to the Lawrence Park uh, near the train station, and similar to what we think of or associate with Lawrence, the kind of curvilineal streets near regular lots. But this is not what we associate with William Lawrence. My guess is that it was just because of the flat land, and it was very... Uh, typical of the time to lay out these grid uh, streets and rectangular lots. They're 50 by 125. There are 80, 58 of them. And um, Lawrence actually had sold a few of them facing White Plains Road to a man in Mount Vernon a few years earlier, but that fellow died, and we were able to, uh, he was able to get the land back and sell it to Concordia. So I think we're all fortunate that we didn't end up with 58 houses, um, uh, sending kids to the school and using, uh, using the public services. <coughs> Whoops, what am I doing? Um, Concordia, remember, has our boys in, in the city with no campus, and so they move very quickly to engage uh, a well-known architect, Edward L. Tilton. Uh, and I can't find any connection between him and Concordia either. He may have been the low bidder. There are records in the files of another architect expressing interest. But there also was probably concern about getting an experienced architect to build a campus that would not fall apart as quickly as Hawthorne had. Um, Mr. Tilton had studied or rather worked with McKim, Mead, and White, which was the preeminent architecture firm of the time. He'd studied in Paris at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts. And he was a leader of that style at the time in America. He was uh, a local guy. He was from Mount Vernon. And he knew the Chambers family, one of the leading Bronxville families, and had remodeled their gorgeous old stone mansion on Crow's Nest overlooking um, the Bronxville School on that hill. He had also designed the Mount Vernon Carnegie Library in 1903. This is the, the front. And this is the back, which is now the front. People go in that back side, and the other side has been marred by subsequent additions. But he's most well known with a partner for his design of the 
several of the main buildings at Ellis Island, for which they won um, prizes and awards and became uh, known. So we were very fortunate to have Edward L. Tilton come, and he came up with this design. This is um, the 14 acres. This is Concordia Place here, although it goes out to Tanglewild. And um, very quickly, they hired a New York City construction company after some rebidding and uh, bidding. And they plan to build the first three buildings. And they don't look like this, but the locations are the same. This is the main administration building, Feth Hall. This is the first dormitory, Bohm. And back here was where the uh, Commons is now built. And then eventually, in, later in 1910, this house for the president, one Concordia Place, was built. That was the beginning of the campus. Uh, these big dormitories, four of them along Tanglewild, never materialized. Chapel here did not get built. And this, uh, I think they called this a gymnasium, was not built. Ultimately, this um, dorm is in place and this row of housing. The contract for the building of those th first three buildings called for the work to be done in 200 days, which is about what it would take to put a kitchen in today, I think. Um, but they were guided by the school uh, schedule. That would have gotten the boys back up here for the fall of 1909. And as we've already know told you, that didn't happen. Uh, it actually took about 10 months to build the, the first part of the campus, which is still, by today's standards, really quite an amazingly fast project. Um, there wasn't any zoning. There was no OSHA requirements. There weren't mm -hmm. limits on um, the hours you could work, no minimum wages. So they had some advantages we don't. Um, in May, the cornerstone was laid on Feth. Let's see if we can make it. There we go. And that cornerstone is still there on the corner of Feth, and it looks um, completely unweathered. I, mean, I think it looks just like it was there. Uh, Reverend Kepkin came out. He's standing, uh, I was just told this evening, this is he right here, standing behind the speakers, and he coordinated the, um, the event, which brought 3,000 people, according to the news uh, stories of the time, out to the campus. Um, there were 109 Lutheran congregations represented, which seems incredible until you read that Reverend Kepkin um, was presiding over, or at least there was a convention of Lutherans going on in Manhattan, and he said, let's go to Bronxville. <laughs> so they took a special train out from Grand Central. It was 49 cents a head round trip, and um, the crowd came. Cornerstone is supposed to have in it a number of documents, including a list of those people who had contributed money, the Lutherans, to uh, build the campus at, up to that point, which ultimately cost, uh, apparently with land, about $220,000. There were speeches in German and English, which also was the case with classes, although more and more the classes were being conducted in English. There was local news coverage in the Bronxville Review and the Daily Argus. About three weeks later, there was another big event in Bronxville that brought several thousand people out. It had nothing to do with Concordia. This is a scene from the 1909 pageant, which was orchestrated by William Lawrence. Uh, about a thousand villagers participated with their horses and costumes, and it was to celebrate the opening of the new Lawrence Hospital, opened on June 1, 1909. None of those buildings survive, but basically it's facing the train station. Then again in November of 1909, the Concordia um, constituents returned to campus, this time for the dedication of the, of the buildings. Um, the weather had been rotten all week, and I guess they could, had long-term pro projections because they engaged this uh, tent to hold 2,500 people. It happened that that day was beautiful, and they didn't really need the tent. Lutheran weather, they called it. But another <laughs> 3,000 people or so came out 
to um, Concordia for the dedication. The buildings, unfortunately, weren't finished. This picture is, was not taken that day, and it, as you can see, it turned into an ad for one of the vendors, but you can see um, the buildings are basically done. There's construction rubble, no landscaping. And on the day of the dedication itself, this is a picture that was taken that day. You can see no windows here in the, in the building, and there's some scaffolding and, and the like, but everybody was pleased nonetheless. This is um, the Commons building, and there are ladders laying along the, the foundation. Um, again, there were special trains. People had lunch in the Commons. And again, there was news coverage with the local papers. And there was something in the um, New York Times, which I didn't get copied. Uh, one of the press um, articles called this one of the highest elevations in the vicinity with excellent views of Long Island Sound. <laughs> and um, on a good day, the Hudson Palisades. And you see that over and over again uh, as various institutions and um, real estate agents advertised early Bronxville. So it must have been true. And all I can think of is that there were uh, the trees simply hadn't grown up. Uh, but it would have been from the top of Feth Hall that you could have seen that. Uh, another newspaper in the uh, county wrote that the first three buildings at Concordia attract attention from all who pass, but generally little is known about them. Uh, and I think that was the case. I don't think there was very much interaction with the people in Bronxville. There's no indication that the crowd of 3,000 involved uh, the mayor or anybody from the village. Uh, we do differently now, Mary. <laughs> uh, this is another shot of the buildings. A little bit later, this landscape now, and they seem to be having all their windows. Um, they call this uh, scholastic or collegiate Gothic. I don't know if that's a real architecture style. It had um, uh, red and yellow bricks, as you all know, and um, trim that they called terracotta, which to me looks like cast concrete. You'll see, uh, this is the, these are modern pictures of the front door of Feth, and um, the terracotta or cast concrete is still there. This is, I think they call this a Luther rose. This looks like a cabbage. But there's some attractive <laughs> Catholic cabbage, maybe. This is um, a Bohm Hall as it was uh, just finished. Oh, is it going to stick on me? There we go. Whoops. And that's the commons. Again, I don't think the landscaping has come in, so this is really probably 1910. You can see above the doors a uh, little design work. And here is a close-up, a modern shot. There's a pair of lions rampant over each of those doors, which was a very nice touch. This shot, uh, again from about 1910, was probably taken from the top of Feth, looking down. And I included it because look at the background. We're out here in the woods. Just There's nothing. Which um, raises the next question that I wanted to address, and that is what was out here in Bronxville when Concordia came? This is a 1914 atlas. And you'll see here's Concordia. There are lots laid out, but these little squares represent structures. So you see there are relatively few structures in that part of town, lots of open space. This is an earlier atlas. This is actually 1910. And there were, this is Lawrence Park, closer to the train station. There were about, um, I think I counted about 65 houses by 1910 in that section of town. And the New York Times in uh, March of 1909 had a little article about Bronxville remarking on that spring's busy construction in the village a quarter of a million dollars was being spent on uh, 35 private homes, the new hospital, and a studio building, which is Studio Arcade, down by the train tracks. All this without even mentioning Concordia, but we'll forgive them because Concordia had just broken ground a couple of weeks before the article. The other thing that's interesting about 1910 Bronxville, I think, is that 
it was full of institutions. There, of course, was Concordia. Right in here was another school founded a little bit earlier called Brantwood Hall for girls. This area was a boys' private uh, prep school, Massey School. And then right next to it was another 16 acres or so, the St. Martha's Society for Wayward Girls. <laughs> <laughs> We know next to nothing about them, but the um, census records at the time list the, uh, the people there as inmates. So um, they were apparently abandoned or orphaned young women who were being trained to be servants. We also have over in this area a section that was Bronxville's insane asylum. Um, quite genteel. Up here was a large 51-acre lot, a section of land owned by the New York Institute for the Blind, and they did not build here. Uh, there was a tremendous uh, local opposition, but at this point, that was open land owned by, the, by an institution. And finally, down in this area is a section that had been given to a, um, a foundation that ultimately built the Burke Rehabilitation Center in, Mount, in the White Plains. But this land was uh, set aside for convalescent purposes, so we came quite close, I think, to having uh, a, a major hospital in that corner of town. The hospital is over here, and of all these institutions, there are only two who survived, the hospital and Concordia, and we're both celebrating a century in the village. Uh, what was student life like? We should talk a little bit about that. These are the first faculty members. Six of these gentlemen were here when the school opened in January. They taught six years of English, six years of Latin, six years of German, five years of Greek, five years of mathematics, six years of religion, five years of history, and four years of Hebrew, and the Hebrew was taught in German. So it was, it was a very, very strong curriculum. This gentleman here in the middle, in the front, is President Henry Feth. He was president of the college from 1895 until 1917. This is the a faculty member who was added in the fall of 1910. His name is uh, Professor Poulard. He was a 1908, I mean, yes, 1908 graduate of Harvard, and he came to teach the natural sciences, physics, chemistry, and the reason for that was that in 1910, Concordia was approved to offer the New York State high school curriculum, and they needed the sciences, and that allowed them to prepare students not just for the Lutheran Seminary, which we associate the college with so much, but also to go to secular colleges. And this is another precursor of the future because the vast majority of our students now do not go to seminary and the curriculum is largely secular. And just another note, this um, professor here, Professor Heinz, was a graduate himself of Concordia. And this is him in his class in the city in 1883 is the equivalent of a high school junior they don't make high school juniors like that anymore. <laughs> the um, faculty had an office right inside Feth Hall. Right outside the office on the interior wall was this uh, great old plaque. This honored the first president of Concordia, uh, Reverend Bohm. And I particularly like the description. He's called a ripe scholar. I can't read the rest of it, but... Um, we found this plaque in the basement of one of our buildings, and it is right now down in Mount Vernon being refurbished. I went down and saw it as they were just starting last week, and it is going to be beautiful. We're going to reinstall it in Feth Hall near its original location. This is a classroom in the building of Feth. Um, there are eight large classrooms, um, and these doors and windows are still there, unchanged. 
This is the physics classroom, which was on the first floor of Feth in the sort of the northeast corner where offices are now, and right below it was the chemistry lab, which um, they were very proud of because it had individual gas connections and electric connections for the student uh, workstations. This is the interior of our commons building, and for those of you who have been in um, the dining hall, it looks a lot like that today. That furniture was uh, donated, or rather the cost of it, was donated by the Ladies' Society of the Lutheran Churches of the Borough of Queens. And there's a plaque inside uh, of the building recognizing that, dated November 21, 1909, which was the date of the dedication. And it has a, a psalm on it which was quite suitable. It says, The eyes of all wait upon thee, and thou givest them their meat in due season. Um, I, would, I would mention that the college is still supported to a small degree by uh, uh, East Coast uh, congregations. This is where the meat was cooked. This, um, I love this stove. It was nine feet long, and in 1909 it cost over $4,000. Uh, this is the servery in the common. I mean, this is the pantry at that time. It's now the servery in our commons. The commons also had a laundry for the entire campus, and um, connected to it was a power plant, which produced the electricity for the campus and steam heat. These are a part of a system that was called a perfect system for circulating steam. But they had a lot of trouble. It did not circulate well. And uh, the uh, vendor was called out to campus to inspect and look at it and try to make it work several times until in 1911, Reverend Kepkin got a letter. Actually, it went to someone else, but I'm sure Reverend Kepkin was familiar with it, which uh, refused to come again until they got a competent man in charge of the plant. They said, your engineer is too stupid and incompetent to operate the plant properly. <laughs> That's pre-New York Times v. Sullivan. That's before we had libel law. <laughs> These boilers are gone, but we uh, still have the central steam plant uh, heating a number of our buildings, and we do have the old pipes, 100 years old, and they are still causing some grief. But it's the pipes, <laughs> not the not the uh, plant manager this time. <laughs> Dormitory life involved two-room suites in the uh, Bohm Hall. This is the sleeping room. Four guys would share that. There was a connecting room to a study room, and there were four desks in here, and the college provided those uh, study lamps. This is uh, the, one of the rooms in 1912, a little bit later when uh, it had been decorated by students, and I think I see some pinups on the wall along with pennants. Um, this is the washroom that they all shared in the basement of that building. I would say that those dorm rooms are still very much um, in use, and they look very similar to that. The, um, let me just show you the radiators are still there. And uh, they're no longer two-room suites, and it's now a girl's dorm. This is the class of 1911. I didn't come across one of 1910, but most of these guys would have been here in January of 1910. And this is, um, well, I should go back for a minute. The, the students who were here in 1910 came from eight eastern uh, states, although most of them were from New York. And they had various clubs on campus, a literary club, a mandolin club, a chess club, a checkers club, and of course, the sports. Um, tuition was free if you were going to go on and become a Lutheran minister. If you weren't, it was $40 a year. The um, board was $10 a month. Books were about $10 a year. And um, for those of you who have written tuition checks any time recently, you know that fees are a big part of it. And we had a fee in 1910, a $2 fee for medical uh, attendance, which is about 5% of the tuition. So we're not doing too badly today on, on fees. 
there was a nurse's station uh, in the commons. This is a page from the 1911 yearbook. Uh, these fellows had been in uh, classes at Concordia since at least 1907, and um, I was just amazingly, pleasantly surprised when I found this, that we were integrated in 1910, 1907, actually. This young man here is an African-American from Staten Island, and he was 18 years old when he came out to his first classes in, in Bronxville. Charlie Stoll, and he was a very popular guy. You can see their uh, references to him being a witty, musical, virtuous chap, a brilliant and popular entertainer, and a tobacco fiend, which was meant to be a compliment, I think. The, the boys loved um, smoking pipes, and they had smoker socials that were highlights of their years. Um, when the school was still in Hawthorne, uh, one of the students in 1907 sent this postcard to his brother, and he remarked, there is a darkie studying for minister. He's one of the nicest fellows here. Um, Charlie was, uh, played third base on the baseball team. He's up there in the upper corner. He was quarterback of the football team. He was athletic editor for the 1911 yearbook. And at graduation, he gave an oration in Latin. And uh, it was par uh, it focused on the main character of a Latin or a Roman play that dates to about 200 years before Christ, focusing on the main character who was a slave boy. Students um, seem to have little interaction with Bronxville, as I mentioned before, but I would guess that he was probably the only African American in the village. I've looked at old census records, and maybe I found one um, African American servant, but I, I couldn't swear to that. But he was, um, and the, the Hotel Gramaton was at the time still advertising white service. Uh, as one of the features of its um, offerings. It's, it's really clear that he was an amazing young man, and I think we need to do some more research on, on uh, his background and what became of him. Concordia was, uh, and all of its constituencies, were delighted to have arrived in Bronxville. This is a little bit later in time, but a pretty picture. Um, the college in its um, admission materials, and we have the 1911 view book, uh, promoted the site as um, in Bronxville's Lawrence Park, the most beautiful part of, part of the far-famed Westchester County, and pointed out that Bronxville was a quiet, refined suburb, a good place for a college because it was pretty far from the temptations that would be present in a larger community. The, the students in their yearbook showed off a little of their um, Shakespeare reading and said in comparing Hawthorne with Bronxville, not that we liked Hawthorne less, but that we liked Bronxville more. <laughs> this is uh, my final slide. It's a later Kepkin image uh, of Feth Hall in later years. And it, it just brings to mind the enormous changes that the college has seen as, of course, the entire world in the last uh, century. Here, women have now been students for 70 plus years. Campus has doubled or so in size. It's become a four-year college, no longer any high school courses since the 70s. A mostly secular curriculum. The college is much more involved in the local community and most of the students are not Lutheran. But those beautiful original buildings look very much the same from the exterior. And the college today is still an institution of faith in the Lutheran tradition, still doing its best to prepare students for lives of service to church and community. So I hope you'll all join with us in wishing Concordia another successful century. Thank you very much.
I wanted to thank two people who helped me a lot. Uh, you saw, I think, I hope, the pictures out in the, in the hallway, the exhibition. Patricia Miranda, the director of our gallery, designed the posters. She mounted the posters. She hung them on the wall. Without Patricia, there would be a blank wall out there. So thank you so very much. And Brigitte Conkling, I know she's here someplace, um, is our, there you are, uh, Concordia's archivist, was enormously helpful in finding a lot of this original information from me. She's brought order from chaos in the archives, and it's, it's just wonderful. And she was kind enough not to correct me during the course of this talk. <laughs> I know it's been long. I would answer one or two questions, or try to if anyone has one. Sir? What do you think of the comment that the darky moved from Staten Island to the United States? <laughs> <laughs> that is not aimed at him, and they didn't use the word darky there. A lot of the students who lived outside of Manhattan, the uh, yearbook made little remarks like that treated them as not having come from the United States. So that is not specific to him, I'm glad to say. Anyone else? Uh, Emily, so there were many arts in the curriculum, or is it expected at the time that those would just be clubs or things that you would do outside of the formal curriculum? I don't see anything in the curriculum that we would think of as fine arts. Because they have such a tradition. That developed, well, they did have the mandolin club. And for a while, they had a double quartet uh, before they got to Bronxville. Um, the literary club involved uh, public speaking and debate, not, not the fine arts, but uh, composition, things like that. I'm not sure when music became a more important part of the curriculum, but it's not mentioned in the 1911 view book at all. Any sense of what the students did after the two years of college? Did they continue on with their education, or was that their ultimate year? In the, well, in the early years, that was preparation for them to go out to the Lutheran Seminary in St. Louis and study for the ministry, and huge numbers of them did. I mean, they're really, in the, in the early years, uh, many, many, many Lutheran ministers were graduates of this school. In 1911 or so, um, again, this, this admissions pamphlet lists a couple of guys who'd gone on to be lawyers, one doctor, uh, some teachers. That was another fairly early on interest, but they would have to go on to study somewhere else to become a teacher, probably. So most of them in the earliest days did, did become ministers or some kind of church worker. And of course, that's what the church had founded the school for. Because there was, uh, in the 1880s, uh, quite a wave of German immigration, and uh, they were in sh much need of, of pastors. Marsha? Um, going back to the architecture, I, I've seen this, these buildings and maybe Ellis Island, but this sort of a unique, at least to me anyway, architecture. I mean, and maybe Peter can comment on this. Is this the only existence of this? Real, no, whatever you call it. No, no. Um, this particular building, I actually have a picture of a, um, a school in Manhattan that um, Tilton's partner designed. I've forgotten it's a Catholic school and it's still there. Looks almost identical. It's just seven stories tall and it's a little <coughs> different on top. I don't know, Peter. Um, I've asked you before what sort of architecture you should call this. I was going to send you some pictures of Rice University. Uh -huh. it's, it's, I think it's a little similar. I mean, it's not what you would automatically regard as remarkable because they always have pitch roofs and pointed arches and all kinds of things that are absent. Yeah, I don't, I don't know much more about it. Maybe? What was the name of the architecture? The architect or the architecture? The architecture. Well, they called it um, College Gothic in the yearbook, and I read something else, one of the newspaper articles called it Scholastic Gothic. <laughs> I don't know. It's not, a, not a, something you read about in architecture books, I don't think. Mary? Do the buildings in Hawthorne still exist? No. That building um, 
when they had all the trouble, they ended up selling it to a Catholic school, and they say they made full disclosure. <laughs> <laughs> but that school also had no luck with it, and it actually burned in 1917. And Reverend Kepkin has a glass slide of the burned out structure. Uh, a few years ago, as Paul mentioned, uh, someone from Hawthorne called us from the Board of Education, and they said, we have this big old rock. It's got 1893 carved in it. Could that be yours? And so a few of us went up, and we got it, dragged it back here, and it's now installed in front of Fat Paul. It was the cornerstone, but that's all that was left. Uh, it's now a, a public school campus. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. <laughs> With all those institutions planned in the village, what happened? Different things happened to different ones. The Brantwood Hall uh, School lasted till 1947 and went out of business. The Massey School moved to Stamford, and I don't know the ins and outs of that, but about uh, just before the 1920s, and of course it was prime real estate to be developed in um, houses, and that's the Hawthorne Hemlock area. There are great houses up there now. Um, Mother Fatoit's uh, St. Martha Society probably went the same way. I really, we know so little about it. It would be lovely to find something. And of course, the uh, New York Institute for the Blind was just pilloried. Um, the, both Tuckahoe and Bronxville, it spilled into Tuckahoe, the land, were horrified at the thought that their beautiful residential communities could have people walking around with sticks tapping. They were, um, and they just uh, did everything to get them to move. And ultimately, a syndicate of, of real estate um, speculators bought the land at cost. And after the villages had cut Avon Road right through the middle of the property, so that it became much less likely that you could build your campus there, um, the insane asylum went out of business. Um, it really never had too many patients, and um, the psychiatrist who ran it got elderly and moved to Tuckahoe. And the Burke, the Burke, um, Burke land, I, I don't really know, Mary probably knows better, why they ended up building in White Plains and not here. We've speculated that, again, it was the value of the real estate uh, to be developed for residential um, Housing that probably well, made the on another non-profit, untaxed property. I mean, they were very to have a municipality. So, uh, you know, it was so they went up to the Burke. They formed the Burke Institute. But in the meantime, Mr. Burke had died about nineteen. So uh, it was his uh, estate that made these commitments. World War Two, however, did. I mean, World War One. They did have people there. In the, in the mansion that was still there. Yes. But it was all torn down and divided in 1921. I think institutions uh, migrated. They came from Manhattan because it got expensive and they moved out to the country uh, close to a train station, um, built their uh, campuses and the like, and then some of them moved on and others failed. Liz, can you tell us what was across the street on our East Campus when we opened here? Do you, do you know? Um, once upon a time, I knew. Uh, it was, it was a, um, about an 1850s house, I think, Stein Hall. It was called the Gorman property and was owned by a family named Gorman who farmed there. Uh, and there are stories that the Kennedy brothers, the young Kennedys, played their sports with the Gorman kids over there, but, you know, who knows? They did. And before that, it was Madame Carmody, who was a French designer, and she sort of had the summer classes and things, and the uh, musician Charles Ives supposedly spent a summer practicing there, and his, the children here played with him, and then he would go in and play this music, and they were absolutely dumbfounded. Because he was quite a prodigy apparently. You're fortunate to have the two living Bronxville historians here today. Thank you, Mary. Any other questions for Mary or me?
A lot of the, of the boys left, and it was um, women were admitted in 1939 to kind of make up the difference. I don't think there was a big impact from World War I, but World War II did definitely cut into enrollment here. We've got pictures, and actually, I think the pictures are from World War I of a, a sort of a brigade of Concordia students uh, marching. Um, doing maneuvers out here on, on the campus. Thank you so much, and let's go have some refreshments.